One day, I found myself in a situation I could have never imagined. It all started when I took my husband to the doctor for a regular checkup. What was supposed to be a routine visit turned my world upside down. Dr. Lawrence, with a grave expression, shared some shocking news about my husband. The severity in his eyes told me this was no joke. I felt a wave of panic and disbelief wash over me. My husband, who I had cared for through his illness, was now a source of fear and concern. Doctor! Lawrence urged me to consider my safety, suggesting I might need to distance myself from my husband. His words left me feeling overwhelmed and scared. My name is Betty Friedan, and I'm a 50-year-old who has dedicated 10 years to working at a leading pharmaceutical company. That place has become my second home, offering comfort and a sense of belonging. Despite my age, I've continued to work full-time, earning the respect and admiration of my colleagues. Not many people my age are still working as I do, but I've never minded. My dedication to my job was partly because I remained single until four years ago. My manager, Gerald, and I shared a close bond, partly because we were both single. He once jokingly asked if I was ever going to get married, a comment that could have been taken the wrong way, but I knew it was all in good humor. Around that time, I was secretly seeing Richard, who would later become my husband. Richard was a bit older, previously married and divorced, and like me, wasn't interested in having children. We met through a marriage consultation service, seeking companionship for our later years. Choosing to keep our relationship private, we didn't share our plans with anyone, even as our manager made light-hearted jabs about marriage. Eventually, Richard and I tied the knot quietly without a ceremony, simply signing the necessary paperwork at City Hall. The simplicity of the process surprised me, but I was excited for our future together. But now, faced with Dr. Lawrence's alarming advice, I was forced to reassess everything. My feelings of compassion for my sick husband were now tangled with fear and uncertainty. Dr. Lawrence's words echoed in my mind, urging me to take action for my own safety. As I stood there trying to process the situation, I realized I needed to make a decision, and fast. The life I had known and the future I had envisioned were suddenly on uncertain ground. I'm La, and my husband Richard works at a factory. To be honest, I earn more than he does. Richard started his job there right after finishing high school. As for me, I grew up in an orphanage and always dreamt of being independent. That's why I didn't want to quit my job at the pharmaceutical company even after we got married. I loved my job too much. When Richard and I tied the knot, I immediately told my manager, Gerald, about it. He congratulated me, but I could tell he had mixed feelings. Maybe he felt a bit lonely because I, his buddy in singleness, got married first. I tried teasing him about it, but he brushed it off, so I let the matter drop. Despite Gerald's reaction, I was over the moon about starting a new chapter with Richard. I imagined all the wonderful things our future would hold, but reality turned out to be less shiny than my dreams. Life as newlyweds was pretty standard. Not much changed for me, I kept working, and the biggest change was probably moving to a more rural area and commuting by car instead of bus. Richard and I shared my old car because he didn't have one. About a year into our marriage, though, things started to get rocky. Richard began showing signs of depression. He seemed off, hardly eating his breakfast, getting lost in his thoughts, and even getting small things like condiments mixed up. His clothes didn't match and he became quieter at work and at home. Although I've always appreciated Richard's quiet strength, his silence became too heavy, making it feel like I was living alone. This loneliness crept up on me as I noticed these small but significant changes in him. It dawned on me that Richard might be dealing with a mental health issue. Watching someone you care about struggle without knowing how to help is incredibly hard. I decided to take Richard to a clinic that specializes in mind and body health where he was diagnosed with depression. I had a basic understanding of depression, but hearing the diagnosis made my world feel a bit dimmer. The doctor explained that the best way to tackle depression is to address its root cause directly. However, pinpointing the exact reason for Richard's depression was challenging. He had been working at the same factory for years without any issues, and nothing significant had changed in his job. If anything, I worried that perhaps our marriage had somehow contributed to his state. 
During our conversations with the doctor, I assured him that we were living a content life and couldn't identify any direct pressures at home that might have led to Richard's condition. The doctor encouraged us to return if we noticed any changes or had any insights into potential causes of his depression. Despite multiple visits to the clinic, we couldn't find the root cause of Richard's distress. Over time, his depression only deepened. On his worst days, Richard would barely get out of bed, plagued by headaches or calling in sick to work. His appetite vanished, and he lost a noticeable amount of weight. Eventually, he was unable to continue working and had to leave his job. Richard felt terribly guilty for putting all the financial burden on me, but I reassured him that I was okay with working. My primary concern was his well-being. It was tough to see him so affected and I constantly worried about him, especially when I was at work. There was an incident where he went out and couldn't find his way back home, which made me fear he was battling not just depression, but potentially dementia as well. This possibility added to my stress. When colleagues asked about how things were going, I had to admit that Richard wasn't improving. Seeing someone you love struggle so much without a clear way to help is incredibly difficult. Gerald noticed I was looking particularly worn out one day and handed me an energy drink. Drinking it made me feel a little better, and I was touched by his gesture of support. He reminded me that we're all in this journey together, and his words nearly brought me to tears. With everything going on with Richard, I hadn't realized how much stress I'd been piling up on myself. It became clear that I needed to keep myself together, or else I might break down too. So, I threw myself into work, trying to maintain some normalcy in our lives. One years have flown by, and things with Richard haven't improved. In fact, they've only gotten worse. As our third wedding anniversary approached, I couldn't see any light at the end of the tunnel for his condition. Then, one morning, I noticed our car wasn't where it should have been. Confused, I checked again, but the car was definitely missing. Since Richard's diagnosis, I was the only one who drove it. I hadn't used the car since the day before, which meant it should have been at home. Concerned, I asked Richard if he knew anything about where the car might be. He casually mentioned he thought it was there when he got home yesterday. I remembered he had gone out for a bit while I was at work. The doctor had suggested he try walking or jogging to help him cope. If the car was there when he returned, it must have disappeared sometime during the night. With the car gone, I had no choice but to use public transport, which made me about 10 minutes late for work. I explained the situation to Gerald, who was understanding but puzzled about the car's whereabouts. He wondered if Richard might have taken it, but I dismissed the idea. Given Richard's condition and his aversion to driving since falling ill, it didn't make sense. Despite Richard's occasional lapses in memory and frequent mood swings, I couldn't imagine him being responsible for the missing car. The mystery of the car added yet another layer of complexity to our already challenging situation. Right after realizing the car was gone, I didn't waste any time reporting it to the police, hoping it would turn up soon. But deep down, a nagging worry haunted me that it might be gone for good. As if that wasn't enough, something else strange occurred. On the day I was supposed to get my paycheck, I went to the bank to take out some money and noticed that my personal bank account was empty. I was taken aback. We do have a shared account, which I checked next, only to find it was also at zero. This left me completely baffled. Richard and I shared the joint account, but he had no access to my personal account, nor did he know its PIN. Yet, somehow, all our savings had vanished. The cold wave of shock hit me hard, and once home, I confronted Richard. I asked him if he knew anything about the missing funds from our joint account. He seemed genuinely confused and denied knowing anything about it. Considering his state of mind due to depression, I hesitated to press further, fearing it might add to his stress. Richard, with his gaze fixed on the ceiling, seemed distant, lost in one of his frequent dazes attributed to his condition. It made me wonder if he could have actually taken the money. Planning to bring this issue up with the police, I was overwhelmed by the double blow of losing both our car and our savings. The financial pinch was sharp, made worse by my lack of a family safety net, having grown up in an orphanage with no parents to turn to for help. Amidst these troubles, it was suggested that we switch Richard to a larger hospital with more resources than the small community psychiatric clinic we'd been using. 
The clinic had reached its limits in what it could do for him and recommended a general hospital for better care. They even provided a referral letter. So, we decided to make our first visit to the general hospital, taking a taxi there. The experience was new and a bit daunting for me, and throughout the journey, Richard remained quiet, lost in his own thoughts as we arrived at the hospital. Taking a deep breath, I walked into the hospital, handing over the referral letter at the reception and bracing myself for a bit of a wait. Given it was a bustling general hospital, the lobby was crowded with patients, each waiting for their turn. After around an hour, Richard was finally called in for his consultation. While he went inside, I took out a book to pass the time, but barely had Richard entered the doctor's office when a nurse approached me. Excuse me, are you Mrs. Simmons? She asked. I confirmed, and she mentioned the doctor wanted to see me. I was used to discussing Richard's condition, so I assumed it was a similar situation this time and followed her, albeit with a bit of anxiety. The nurse led me to a different room, where I was greeted by a doctor who looked about a decade my senior with graying hair and a kind demeanor. Before I could even settle in, I asked if this was about Richard's condition. He nodded gravely and I prepared myself for potentially bad news. The doctor's next words took me completely by surprise, however. He urged me to distance myself from my husband, revealing that Richard had been arrested for fraud ten years ago. My mind spun with confusion. Why was this coming up now during a routine medical visit? The doctor explained his suspicions about Richard's depression, suggesting that he might be pretending. He recounted recognizing Richard from a surgery ten years ago, where he had treated a deep cut on Richard's leg. The revelation was jarring. Here I was thinking we were addressing Richard's mental health, only to discover his hidden past and a possible deception about his current state. This unexpected turn of events left me reeling, trying to reconcile the caring husband I knew with the person the doctor described. When the doctor mentioned recognizing a large scar on Richard's right leg, everything started to make sense. I knew of the scar but never knew its origin, as Richard had never mentioned it. Learning that the doctor before me was the one who had treated Richard's injury years ago felt like an unbelievable twist of fate. The story unfolded further when the doctor revealed that Richard had injured himself during a dispute with his former wife, a dispute that arose because he had swindled her. He had stolen her luxury items and money. Shockingly, he had also feigned dementia during that time, manipulating his wife into lowering her guard before committing the fraud. This pattern of pretending to be ill to facilitate his deceit was appalling. Hearing about Richard's criminal past and his arrest was staggering. I hadn't looked into Richard's background before marrying him. Being alone most of my life, I was just happy to find someone willing to be my partner. The doctor's stern warning that Richard could be a danger to me sent chills down my spine. There was a seriousness in his tone that made it clear this was no laughing matter. The realization hit me hard I had been deceived. In the days that followed, I struggled to act normal around Richard while secretly planning my next steps. I decided to set up surveillance cameras around our home to watch Richard's activities when I wasn't there. About a week later, I noticed a missing watch and bag. Reviewing the camera footage, I saw Richard leave the house with them and return later with a wad of cash, looking suspiciously pleased with himself. His demeanor did not match that of someone suffering from depression. This footage confirmed my worst fears. Richard was behind the theft of my belongings, the car, and our savings. Facing the hard evidence of his deceit was crushing. Richard had lied to and manipulated me, betraying the trust I had placed in him. It was clear that I needed to take significant action against someone who had pretended to be vulnerable and in need of care, only to exploit my compassion and generosity. The realization that Richard had betrayed my trust was unbearable. I had dedicated my life to working and caring for what I thought was a sick partner. A mere divorce felt too insignificant a response to the depth of deception I had endured. It was clear we needed to part ways, but I wanted more than just a separation. I wanted Richard to truly understand the gravity of his actions and to make amends for the harm he had caused. With a heavy heart and tears threatening to spill, I gathered the divorce papers and meticulously filled them out with all the necessary details. The following day, pretending everything was normal, I informed Richard I'd be stepping out briefly. I had already taken a day off from work, 
explaining the urgency of my situation to my employer, who had agreed to my sudden leave. At the police station, I presented my case, showing the officers the footage I had captured of Richard's deceit. Initially, they were hesitant to proceed based solely on the video. However, after verifying with the pawn shop, where Richard had sold the stolen items and locating my car being sold as a used vehicle, the evidence against him began to mount. It was also confirmed that he had unlawly accessed my bank accounts, and suspicions about his feigned depression were raised. As the truth unraveled, I was overwhelmed by a complex mix of relief and sorrow. The police decided to act swiftly, given Richard's criminal history, and prepared to arrest him. Returning home with the officers in the early afternoon, I found Richard at home, visibly startled by my unexpected presence and the sight of the police. Despite the divorce papers in my hand, his attention was fixed on the officers as one of them declared his arrest for fraud. Richard protested, claiming his depression as a defense. But I knew better. The doctor from the general hospital had already shed light on the likelihood of his deceit regarding his mental health condition. In that moment, facing both the legal consequences of his actions and the end of our marriage, Richard's facade began to crumble. The decision to take this course of action was difficult, but necessary to protect myself and seek justice for the betrayal and manipulation I had endured. On my recent visit to the hospital, a doctor recognized Richard from his past actions. He shared that Richard had once feigned dementia to trick his former wife and expressed doubts about Richard's current claims of depression. Despite these serious accusations, Richard remained unshaken in front of the police, dismissively denying everything. It was as if his history of deceit had prepared him for this moment, showing no sign of guilt or remorse. Richard challenged us, demanding proof of his fraudulent actions. His boldness was baffling especially with the police right there, ready to arrest him based on solid evidence. It was a clear indication of his habitual manipulation and his underestimation of the situation's seriousness. For four years he had lied to me, taking advantage of my trust to steal from me and misuse my goodwill. Yet, in a twisted turn of blame, Richard suggested it was my fault for being too trusting, insulting me further. His audacity was astounding. I had supported him hoping for his recovery, only to be repaid with betrayal and scorn. In that moment, my patience vanished. I declared my intention to seek legal advice and pursue alimony, urging him to face the consequences of his actions at the police station. My outburst surprised even the officers, but it seemed to shake Richard's composure finally. As the police handcuffed him, Richard's defiance crumbled. He looked defeated, his arrogance replaced with frustration as he was led away. Watching the scene, I felt detached, as if observing someone else's life unraveling. Since the doctor's warning, nothing seemed real anymore. Yet, here I was, facing the harsh truth of my situation, determined to move forward from the chaos Richard had created. Watching Richard being led away by the police felt surreal, almost like a scene from a dream. This moment marked a turning point, allowing me to envision a return to my life before the chaos of marriage engulfed it. Though a sense of relief washed over me knowing I wouldn't spend my future under Richard's manipulative control, a wave of loneliness followed. Having waited more than 47 years to marry, the prospect of solitude once again cast a shadow over my newfound freedom. Two months later, our divorce was finalized. The process had been slightly delayed due to Richard's arrest. But by the time everything was official, my emotions had settled, enabling me to reflect on our shared history with a clear mind. Richard's future was uncertain, facing imprisonment for his second offense. I could only hope this experience would lead him to sincerely reconsider his choices. In the wake of our marriage, which had dissolved into nothing more than a disillusioning memory, I found myself pondering my next steps over a simple lunch at work. It was then that my boss, Gerald approached with a casual yet loaded comment as he joined me with his store-bought hot dog lunch. I think you'd be just fine if you were with me, he remarked, almost offhandedly. His words caught me off guard and it took a moment for their full weight to sink in, leaving me momentarily flustered. Yes, I'm serious, he added, seeing my hesitation, his tone smooth yet sincere. I was speechless my lunch momentarily forgotten as I processed his proposition. Gerald then returned to work, 
leaving me to contemplate his unexpected offer in a daze. The idea of a romantic relationship with Gerald had never crossed my mind. Yet I couldn't deny the care and stability he had always shown me. His steady presence and responsible nature suddenly cast him in a new light, despite my initial reaction to evaluate such matters. As I continued eating, the seeds of possibility Gerald had planted began to take root, suggesting a future I hadn't dared to imagine until now. The thought of inviting Gerald out for a meal after work sparked a warmth within me, kindling a sense of hope for the future. Perhaps this was the perfect moment to embark on a new journey, to explore the possibility of happiness and companionship once again. The idea of stepping out of my comfort zone and into a new beginning with someone who had shown me kindness and support felt both thrilling and comforting. Tonight, I decided, could be the start of something new and beautiful.